Right, so we are here with Holly Miller today. Hi, Holly. And Holly has been an in instructional design and technology for like over a decade now. So a lot of experience. Holly's working in the tech space. And Holly is very passionate about um, accessibility and useful, inclusive design, which is what today's session is all about. So thanks yeah, for joining thanks us for today, Holly. Uh, I saw somebody in the chat said they're from the Catskills. I'm from the upstate New York area. So I'm in that Albany, New York area. Uh, about three hours north of the city. So I always like to give shout outs to the East Coasters uh, that are on calls today. Nice. Um, Got some bo borderline cool, locals yeah. here. <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, so uh, before sorry, we go ahead, Devlin. No, it's OK. It's OK. I just wanted to give a little bit more context. I mean, I, I feel like accessibility and, and inclusive design is one of those things where it's like we all know it's like important. But when we're in the daily grind of like, doing projects like it doesn't get as much attention as it it really should that's the impression i get and I've, I've heard other people share that frustration so i imagine all the people here are passionate about designing more accessible learning experiences or more inclusive learning experiences so you are definitely going to help us out with that from what from what i've seen of your work so yeah it it really is that thing until you come kind of across accessibility and the need for it often it is a forgotten or it's really far backstage. Um, I've even my journey into accessibility, it was I was working for a public university and items weren't accessible for a student and no one knew how to make them accessible. And when they tried to make them accessible, they failed using like outside services. So myself and some counterparts had to learn really quick. And it just became this thing of once I learned it and once I had that tool under my belt, it became more and more useful throughout my career in e-learning. Um, and I've just been able to help teach a lot of people some quick things to do to just check fast if something's accessible. And then some things to really think about of why sort of accessibility and inclusive universal design is really important for everyone and it's a human right. Okay, good, good. And and maybe everyone here in the chat can kind of let us know where you're at with accessibility. Have you had that moment where it's like, I need to make this accessible. I have to kind of figure it all out now, or are you, are you not giving it much thought, but you'd like to let us know in the chat just so we get yeah. an idea, but we'll give you some good actionable accessibility tips regardless. <laughs> um, and maybe a good place to start with that Holly would be like, what, what does it mean for something to be sure. accessible? What do we even so mean when, we, say when we talk about accessibility, more often than not, we're talking about 508 uh, federal law, which is kind of laws put in place about standards that should be being used to make sure that individuals who need assistance or adaptive technologies can have those sort of technologies and that the things that we're designing can be used with those adaptive technologies. Um, so if you've never looked at the um, kind of the w3.org website or the, the WCAG, the WCAG sort of accessibility standards, those websites are out there. But from like a designer's perspective, that's a lot of stuff to take in and try to figure out by just reading the websites. So it's a lot of that whole thing of there's support out there and there's standards out there for accessibility, but it's hard to navigate some of the accessibility standards content because it's not designed with universal design and usability in mind for a lot of kind of first time designers. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're saying accessible design. I will often use a lot of interchangeable terms when I talk about it. So I will talk about accessible design inclusive design and universal design. And one thing to know about all of that is all three of those things can roll up into, uh, into universal design. So universal design is considering it to be, is this useful? Like, is it easy to use? Is there um, easy to understand? And then excess inclusive design means you're designing for everybody. So you're designing for internet speeds, you're designing for uh, understanding, you're designing for different levels of learners. Um, and, then in, and then accessible design is specific to those 508 standards. But um, 
So I'll talk a lot about universal design because we should be designing for all and accessibility is a huge part of that designing for all. Okay, perfect. Good distinctions there. So accessibility, we're specifically talking about that 508 compliance, and I see we've gotten a lot of responses on where people are at with this. And yeah, Elvin, uh, we're trying, it's been an afterthought, but we're converting previous projects into more accessible versions, 508 compliance specifically. So guys, I know that's a big push. That's generally a need I see on like design docs and the like. It's like, this needs to be 508 compliant. But um, you're saying, Holly, we're you're trying to help people move beyond that and it's don't just make it accessible but also make it inclusive and useful to get that big um universal design umbrella yeah basically. like in linkedin i saw somebody ask you a question of uh are you going to talk about uh kind of neurodiversity at all too uh, and when we think about that universal design helps with neurodiverse individuals as well too because some of those frameworks of is this usable? Is it useful? Is it easy to navigate? Is there a lot of distractions to it? So the way that we design even for that, um, like I want to push people past that because almost every single person, as I see a lot of people are working in schools or colleges and things of that nature, every single one of you will come up against a lawsuit at some point. That's what has always been told to me. Um, there are a lot of advocacy groups out there for individuals who do need assistance who are going to keep you on your toes and that is a good thing so it is an even better thing to be proactive and to be designing for all from the beginning instead of having to do that retrofitting afterwards because the other thing you'll come up against in that retrofit is oh, but hey, this changes the whole entire experience and this isn't what we wanted the learner to have for that experience when we're retrofitting it. So then you have to ask that question as a designer of, okay, if it's changing the experience, then that meant that you were okay with, with individuals having one experience and those who needed an adaption having a different experience when what we should be aiming for is the same experience for everybody. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So from the beginning, we should be aiming for that. And then, and I didn't want to move past this too quickly because some of us are new to ID, new to digital web experience, new to web experiences, new to, new to accessibility. Um, but you mentioned some like documents or specifications, it sounds like. So the fi 508 compliance, I'm guessing that's like a document. Yeah. Essentially. So I'm going to try to grab the, so it's a section 508.gov. Now what this is, I'm gonna put it in the chat yeah. too. What this is, Perfect. is it's a standard for just about everything for accessibility. So there's part of the 508 that is specific for internet and digital kind of items. Then there's all other parts of 508 for if you're putting in a curb cut, if you're uh, building a new building. So you do have to kind of go in there and, uh, and find policies a little bit when you search 508. But what you can also do is, um, I'm grabbing, I'm trying to copy and paste and talk at the same time. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat the name of the, the WCAG. So you can look up okay. that web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, and I'm gonna do one more link in here for you all too. This one that I'm putting in here is a list of all um, accessibility evaluation tools that have been evaluated by a lot of people. I'll talk about a couple that I use personally, um, but that last link gives you a lot of tools to be able to go through and say, okay, I'm looking for something that's doing colorblindness checking. I'm looking for something that's doing um, just compliance checking. Do I, what level of compliance does my work fall under? Because there are three different levels. So that's something too that you wanna to talk to your institution about is, does your institution have a standard of what level that you should be hitting? And if they don't, my recommendation is always double A. If they do, then you wanna kind of ask those questions of, are we an A standard, a double A standard, or a triple A standard? And that'll help you navigate those uh, web content accessibility guidelines. Okay, perfect. So you shared a lot with us. So you shared us the Section 508 website, 
that has guidelines not just for the web but way beyond it as well it's like the federal guidelines and then we have that w the web content accessibility guidelines that one seems like it's going to be very relevant to to e-learning projects yep. i would imagine yeah that's what you should go okay. going through nice. for that and then that last link is to have some tools that you can put on your web browser or your computer to help you check your work against those accessibility guidelines. And this one is a lot of tools. Like I'm, I'm scrolling through the A's for like a full minute. So you mentioned, which, which will be really useful. I'm sure if there's something we need, we'll find it there. But you mentioned that you have a few, um, favor, a few that you've used more often than others, yeah. I would imagine. So one is called the WAVE, W-A-V-E, evaluation tool. And you can get that as a Chrome, yeah. Firefox, or uh, Edge extension. And that's by far the easiest one that I've ever experienced uh, and, and used before. Um, I keep it on all of my web browsers. Uh, I did a quick check of my own website today uh, just to see where I was. And this is the thing to know is that while I'm very knowledgeable in it, there's still spots where I don't measure up to snuff with some of the things that I've designed. And that's an okay thing too, because you want to be able to identify what things are accessible and what things are not, and then try to fix them or have a plan. Um, that's one of the biggest things out there for those people that are doing the like retrofitting if your institution has a plan and can show the plan for retrofitting, then you are kind of under an umbrella of um, protection for legal ramifications. So as long as you know what your what things are not accessible and you're working on fixing them, mm -hmm. um, then there is a lot of good faith that is put forth for that. Um, another tool that's really great, I'm gonna put it in the, the chat for you as well, is this tool, it's called Assistive Labs. And one of the really great things about Assistive Labs is it's specific about screen readers. And until you've experienced a screen reader, like it is really hard concept to understand. Like, you know, okay, well, this, it reads the screen, it puts it out into audio so that somebody can hear it. But all of the headings that we use and all of the formatting that we use on websites and even Word documents, all of that matters. Because if you don't place those different style headings and formats, then the screen reader just reads forever. And it just is this big, long jumble. And somebody who's advanced in screen readers and uses them daily, they know how to navigate and jump to the next header to get their information that they need but if you don't put the headers in then they're really lost and the same thing goes with kind of putting those alt tags in behind pictures but you want to be very very descriptive about your alt tags um, netflix has done this really great job of uh, alternative um, closed captioning so it describes the images that are on the screen um, it, it describes title sequences and things of that nature too. So then that way, somebody who's using adaptive technology gets the whole picture. So that's things to understand too. And I see in the chat, um, PowerPoints and tables. Tables are a huge, huge, huge thing. And those people who are working in the math and science areas too, um, those are tricky items. But in the web accessibility evaluation tools, there are some table management tools that are in there as well too. too. Um, and I'll try to look for some more of those that I have in um, with colleagues and friends and stuff too, to find out about tables, because that's a big sticking point for a lot of people too. Okay, great. I thank you all for sharing your perspective in the chat as well. So um, assistive labs, this will basically is this will this function as a screen reader or does this just say here's how it would do for it's kind a of a, a little bit of both like it will function as like a okay. screen reader for you and mimic it it's like um like a simulator to a certain degree okay so if we so using this tool we would get a feel for what it's like to use a screen reader if we haven't used Correct. one before okay perfect so that sounds like a good one to explore 
Um, sorry, I don't know what's going on with my video. And feel free to ask questions if you all have questions too. We're, we're all we're here for you. I have some questions for okay. you though, Holly, as we move through some of this. So I know some people may get confused on like the 508 versus like the WCAG and all of that. Like if we if we follow these like um, WCAG, if we follow those guidelines, do we can we just kind of imagine? Okay, so we're 508 compliant for these web experiences, or um, I know you have a perspective too on like the guidelines and all of that. Uh, but it's like, yeah, do we need to like, okay, here's the 508 stuff, here's the WCAG stuff, like, I need to be looking at everything, or is it like, if I follow the WCAG when I'm designing an e-learning experience, I should be pretty good to go? When you're, if you're following the WCAG guidelines while you're designing, you should be good to, good to go. I will say this, though, like, almost everybody falls out of compliance at some point. Um, technology mm. is always changing, different things are happening, so... So every so that's a thing to know and to just sit with that uncomfortability of that almost everything falls out of compliance at least once while you're designing something, um, and and my easy thing too of like if you're evaluating something or if you're building something if you can't use your keyboard to navigate it then you've got some accessibility work to do. So if you can't navigate with the arrows, the space bar and the enter button on your keyboard, then that item, that vendor, that website that you're looking at, then that's not going to be accessible for anybody who is using adaptive technology. So that's always my first tried and true evaluation is that. And then if I'm working with an outside company or a vendor, I always ask for their um their vpat which is their vol voluntary technical accessibility plan and so many companies have to have this plan and be able to provide it if they don't that that means accessibility is not on the forefront of their minds and that's something that you should be kind of requesting or asking as those first steps of uh if you're working with a vendor or if you're working with a tool um, or if you're trying to even get your stuff up on somebody else's site, that's always a good thing to ask about is what's your VPAT and then see if you can navigate that site through using your keyboard. Hey, yeah, that seems like a good first step. So thank you for sharing that. So if anyone designing learning experiences that you can't navigate with a keyboard, Good sign to dive deeper and um, figure out how to make that work. I, I want to get clear on the terms because that, that was intimidating for me when I'm new to accessibility, like all of the different like standards and documents and terms. And I know it's more about like the people, like what do the people actually need? I know that's what you, you know, you're an advocate for that. But um, I remember when I was like working with clients, I'm like, okay, now on to accessibility. Like, can you tell me more about our audience? They're like, oh, our audience. Yeah everyone can hear, everyone can see, like, we don't need to worry about that. We don't want to invest in that, basically. <laughs> so do you, what, yeah. do you, what do you have? To People say that all the time. <laughs> and the, my biggest yeah. point back to them is, have you ever watched a YouTube video in a crowded place that was really noisy and you put on the closed captioning? And more often than not, people are like, yeah, like, or it's, I didn't want to wake my kid. So I put on the closed captioning so I could read that. Like, that's a benefit like yes you might be able to hear and yes you might be able to see but you're also if you design with the captions in mind if you design with kind of everybody an equitable use in mind then then like you're doing a one-up you're showing the people who they think are not in the room because there's many like invisible disabilities that are out there um that they think their audience is one way, but there's a whole bunch of things that are out there that if you just design in a universal design format, then it not only helps people who um, who might not need adaptive or assistive technology, but then it also sends a really great message to those people who do, that they didn't have to ask for it. They didn't have to step up and yeah. like self-identify that they were just included in part of the whole entire environment. And that does leaps and bounds for individuals that have to kind of fight the battle every single day. 
um, it lets them know that they're home and it lets them know that they're going to be taken care of. And that creates kind of that loyalty user, uh, which is something almost every brand wants to have. Yeah. Okay, good. And and that resonated with some people in the chat as well. It seems, yeah, as you said, that seems like a common kind of reaction. But like you said, it's not just helping the people who really need it. It can, it can help everyone use the experience more easily. But then also the people who do really need it, yeah, it's going to go way further for those people. Um, and, and, yeah, maybe the stakeholders like higher up or more disconnected from the audience might be like, oh, we don't need that. But like people actually do need that whether they know it or not, most likely. Um, I saw somebody yeah. asked in the chat if if we went over at all, what kind of universal design sort of um, means. Um, and we talked like we did high overview sort of stuff, but you, universal design, if you look it up on the, on the internet, there are seven basic principles of it. Uh, equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, um, perceptible information, tolerance for error, low physical effort, and size and space approach and use. And that can happen in physical environments and that can happen in designing for digital environments as well too. So um, so universal design is the standard and practice which I design in, and then inclusive and accessible design kind of gets wrapped up into those seven principles for me with following the guidelines that are provided by the federal government. Perfect. Um, something else you mentioned too, which again, on like the terms piece, so the A, the double A and the triple A, um, what is that even referring to? So they're accessibility levels, right? So it's like the more A's you have, the more accessible you are. Is that yeah, the idea? Yeah, kind of. Um, so it's the more parts of accessibility that you're looking at. So um, not having any standard is like ground zero, it's like negative one or like negative A, I guess you could say. And then the A standard is just looking at the bare basic minimums, um, the things that will make you kind of get by legally, um, the things of saying we have a plan in place, but not all of our things are accessible yet. And then when you start stepping up into double A or triple A standards, it's really kind of it goes to your company's core mottos and beliefs and uh, values. So it's a double A standard is pretty typical across educational um, companies and across kind of corporate companies. Um, there are some companies out there though that do strive for a triple A standard and that triple A standard is kind of looking at every single bit of, of the design of of for every type of uh, accessibility standard there is out there. Um, somebody asked if there's good examples we could look at to see a double A and triple A work. And there are out there, uh, even if you just take that sentence in the chat, Anna, and throw it into Google, usually a couple of different samples will come up. Um, a lot of the times it's the behind the scene things that make it a triple A standard versus a double A standard. Um, but even having the A standard is still better than having nothing. Um, and it really is that, that who do you wanna be as a designer and who, and versus also who your company wants to be as a company. Uh, there has been many times where I've worked for companies that did not have a set standard or that were to the A standard. And I didn't feel great putting my name to those things when they were just designed with that standard in, in place. So I would often present things that I knew hit the double A standard because I was practicing all of my universal and inclusive design skills into what I was designing. And they were like, okay, it checks all the A boxes. And like, they were happy with that. They didn't like, it would, didn't cost them anything extra. I designed it the first shot. So I didn't have to go back and do iterative design for that. So, um, so those are things too out there of thinking about accessibility and thinking about kind of equitable use for people of who do I wanna be as a designer and 
and how do I want to model that within the companies I work at or the freelance opportunities I take on. Nice. Okay. So even though it didn't need to be double A, you're like, this is important. I know it's going to hit single A, so I might as well take that extra step for the audience yeah. I'm serving. Um, can you give, do you have any examples off the top of mind of like what might an, an A standard look like and what may be like what the slightly more rigorous like double A? Like what are some of those requirements? I don't, don't know off the top, know of, off head, the top of my okay. head, although I did see that somebody okay. put in a link in the um, the chat and I'm looking at it real quick just to give it a glance of like even the first thing that's on there it's kind of showing you through the different levels of colorblindness and kind of what that can do for your design so you when like when you're designing like they have the bar charts there so if somebody was colorblind and there's just three colors there that are denoting what the the intention of that bar chart is then they're not going to see that but as soon as you put in a texture overlaid with it then you can see that and a screen reader can see that as well so that's the same thing with like uh when we always say don't ever write click here and have the click here be the link because the there's nothing that like delineates that you can say like follow like the register like you have for your for this chat it was like register at the link and then the link followed and was right there instead of being like click here to register and it just being the here the word here um so it's it's things like that it's when you're doing just all text copy in a word document if you really want to emphasize a point don't put it in bold red put it in bold and italicized because then somebody who has a visual impairment doesn't have to worry about that. And a screen reader can hear that it's bold and italicized and can let the person know um, that there's there. Right. So it's, it's your, you're gaining points on the different levels for A, double A and triple A. And so um, that's kind of the, the triple A is that there's 68 criteria total but that's a lot of stuff. Uh, the double A is at 38, so it's that middle of the ground. Um, so that's a lot of stuff to keep kind of in your consideration. And some of those uh, accessibility checkers, the wave one that I mentioned particularly, so easy to just click on the extension and it can show you kind of the level and the status of, of where the tool hits. Okay, great. And I and I noticed for these different levels and these different like criteria, it's citing the WCAG like 2.0. So is it or is it directly based off of that? Like the levels are based on the WCAG yep, guidelines? That's exactly what they're based on. Okay, great. So if so if we're serious about designing these like accessible web experiences, WCAG is a safe thing to kind of like study and learn like yeah. um, pretty well. And then, of course, acknowledging that it can that it, it's it's an evolving document or standard. It sounds like too. Yes, and I'm trying to like look up really quick um, because I know that it's out there. Um, I know the New York State uh, like education system, so like SUNY, the uh, State of New York University yeah. system, they created an online MOOC that was free. Um, to teach people about accessibility and for people to go through and kind of get a better understanding about accessibility. Um, and I know that because of myself and a lot of colleagues helped work on that accessibility MOOC and it does a really great job nice. of kind of giving you a really detailed overview, a lot of different tools. And it's one of those things that, um, that can help you at work. Like you can say, hey, this is professional development. I wanna take this free course. Um, and after taking this free course, I can help our department in this way, in this way, in this way. Can I get the time uh, or can I get some reduced time to be able to um, to take that course? I'm trying to find it. I have a link and I'm hoping that it's gonna to, to pop open. 
Um, oh, Holly shared the Yeah, movement. so it's a partnership between Buffalo State um, University and SUNY Empire State College, which I used to be an employee at SUNY Empire State College. And you just have to sign up for it, but it's a self-paced course. Um, and it's through the Canvas uh, learning management system. And it's a really good, thorough sort of training ground for, um, for accessibility, especially accessibility people who are working in K through 12 and higher education. Perfect, okay, good. Um, Elvin had a question as well. So for developing e-learning with like Storyline, Captivate, those standard e-learning authoring tools, are there any integrated accessibility tools that can help help streamline creating these accessible, inclusive final products? The tools themselves are getting a little bit better about things, um, particularly like using RISE 360 through Articulate Storyline. Um, that is getting better about some of their accessibility tools. There's still a lot of it, like when you're designing in uh, Articulate Storyline or Captivate of how quickly is the motion happening in these tools. So if you're doing a lot of motion carousels, you there is a state there is a standard in the um, the WCAG that tells you how many seconds each slide should at least be uh, to help with those like carousels or motion. Uh, I just worked with one of the designers on my team for website scrolling and like the motion scroll. And so we looked up the standards uh, for that and that gave us the, uh, gave like the developer all of the standards for speed and everything um, for that motion scroll technique. So the the e-tools themselves are getting better because more institutions are pushing back and saying we need accessibility in these tools. Um, so there's some bare bones sort of things in those. But if you start to think about those things of, you know, if I was somebody who like, if you put a video into the course and you're like, you want to make sure that there's there's closed captioning for that or that you want to make sure that there's a transcript that somebody could pop out and read that transcript instead of watching the video. Um, same thing with like some of the matching games that are more uh, HTML5 based. Um, some of those for individuals who have uh, neurodiversity in their background, some of that becomes too confusing. So there's this thing for neurodivergent people that if you can design in this wayfinding type of way, that makes sense that there's this dedicated path instead of jumping from like point A to point C to point D to point F to like, if you have to make people search for everything instead of like laying it out in a path or even giving a preview of the path, like at the top of the page or at the top of the module and then allowing somebody to know, okay, that's the preview of what it should be. And then it'll make sense as it follows down. Uh, even those types of things are super helpful across the board. Um, so the tools are getting better um, and there's basics in there, but then it's really like the brain of the designer that can help make it even more accessible. Okay, okay, great. And maybe we can talk a bit more about, about who all to be considering, who all should have a seat like at this table, so to speak. Um, when we think about accessibility or some of these guidelines, it seems like a lot of it is for people who like have trouble seeing or hearing. Uh, you also mentioned people who are neurodivergent. Is there, are there any other things that people may not think of where it's like people may have a harder time engaging with their learning experiences because there's, of, there's a lot of group? things. Um, and, and yeah. truthfully, it's everybody should have a seat at the table. Right. And, and when yeah. you're, if you're designing with that universal design mindset, then you're designing for other things besides accessibility um, and and kind of adaptive technology standards. Uh, I worked at a previous institution where we were very, very video heavy and very like large file format. But then our population was a population where socioeconomic status wise and inter and like high speed internet, those two things didn't make it possible for like computers with processing speed that would be able to handle the videos and internet that could also be able to handle the videos. So 
even something like that of thinking about that if you design with a universal design mindset then you're creating videos that can be streamed just about anywhere that don't take up too much bandwidth that if somebody was paying with a prepaid like MiFi device or if somebody was going to McDonald's to grab free Wi-Fi would they be able to access the thing so when we talk about accessibility and everything too it's access it's access and inclusion and inclusion is that thing of like like awareness is being like oh there's other people at the party that are different than me and like i'm going to i'm going to invite them in right inclusion is having people at the party and then dancing with them right and like having a great time and everybody dancing no matter what the song is no matter if there's a silent dj where you have a headset on but it's that everybody there is having the same experience. And that's the biggest thing from an instructional design mindset that is really hard. And sometimes it takes the fighting the good fight and you'll get turned down and told to just do the bare minimum many times in your career. But I know every time I've offered something up where I've had all of my notes in my PowerPoint slide where I've offered a transcript or where I've gone in and corrected my uh, closed captioning that I've always had somebody reach out to me later to say, thank you for doing that or thank you for bringing that to light. And mm -hmm. even somebody like myself, like I don't have a visible disability, but I have a problem with flashing images on a computer. Like it could potentially bring up a seizure for me. So that's also the other way that I got into all of this is trying to make people understand, like, you don't have to think that the person's in the room because guess what? They always are in the room. You just might not know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So it's leading by example and just like applying this to your own design approach, whether you get like permission from stakeholders or whoever it is or not it's just and like, there's still yeah, like such like there's still so many instructional designers out there that don't have this background so when you do have this knowledge and when you can talk about it or when you can bring up in an interview like oh hey i checked out your 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 website and like you guys are like a great double a standard of accessibility that's like an easy like uptick in your interview of being like oh, this person knows about accessibility. And then if you talk about like, oh yeah, I have the wave extension on my web browser, or I've used the like ad adaptive labs tool, or I know what JAWS screen reader sounds like, all of those things are helpful ways to sprinkle in how you're a different type of instructional designer. And that only helps differentiate you from a pool of people. Um, and it's been something that I've presented on regionally and nationally, and I never get tired of talking about it, and I never get tired of teaching people about it. Yeah, but good, but good point about that too, because there are a lot of new ideas here, people who are looking for their first opportunities or new opportunities. And yeah, accessibility is definitely one of those areas that you could kind of show. I know something about this. I'm applying this to my work. You can see it in my portfolio. You can see it in my write-up. I can talk knowledgeably about it. Like you said, um, I don't think that most instructional designers can do that. It's kind of sad, but thank you for being here and helping us all like yeah. do better. So, yeah, very helpful. Um, I think Elvin kind of picked up on your approach here. Elvin, um, it looks like being intentional is greater than the tools and 508 compliance. Yeah. Like I know you had a perspective yeah, on Yeah, it's definitely like that thing of like, uh, like MacGyver could fix anything with like uh, a paper clip, a rubber band and a piece of chewing gum, right? So if you're intentional about your design, then you can figure a way to kind of work with the tools and the compliance. Um, because sometimes it's just being like, do I need that pretty shiny thing? Or am I using something that's a useful pretty thing? So sometimes even just having that question uh, in the back of your head is, is this thing useful and use like easy to use by like everybody? Or is it just that it's really that pretty shiny piece of new technology? And you'll come up against that a lot in your career as well. 
of somebody in your company saying, hey, we bought this tool. And you're like, this tool's not accessible. Yep. Um, and so the biggest thing that you can do then is work with your accessibility standards team at the company. And more often than not, they can put a little pressure on the vendor and say, hey, we know we signed a contract with you and you're not accessible, but can you work with us on what your roadmap is going to be uh, to become accessible? So there's a lot of things you can still do, even if somebody above your pay grade has made the decision and you have to work with that decision too. Okay, good suggestion. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I went through all of my questions for you. I know more have been coming up while you've been speaking, but we'll we'll turn to the audience for a little too. Um, Anna Anna wonders if it's um, a good idea to look at your work and ask yourself, like, I wonder if I can imagine anyone who couldn't access this or would have a hard time accessing yeah. this. Yeah. Um in one of my old jobs, our, my like top level CEO was colorblind and you wouldn't have known uh, until you sent him something. And then he was like, I don't know which thing to select. And then you were like, oh, wow, okay. And sometimes even things just as like contrast. So like in our chat, that's over, over that way, that way on my screen. Uh, uh, yeah, this is, so it's reversed. Yeah. Even on all of the little text boxes where you're typing, notice that there's a white background, then there's a lighter gray background, and then there's the dark contrast text. That's a great accessibility feature right there because it's looking at the contrast between the background and the text, and it's providing that extra layer there to delineate where there's a conversation but also to make it easier for your eyes to read and, and access that information. Right. Heather is um, discussing access accessibility checkers, like Word and PowerPoint and Excel have them built in. Seems like we don't have that for like Storyline, for example. Um, but I imagine some of the tools you shared with, like the browser extensions at least, I imagine that could kind of slide by slide evaluate the Storyline yeah. slides. Once we have it published. Um, yeah, that, that does help with that when it's published. Um, and PowerPoints and Word are like the worst. And it's the, the thing that most people forget about, as well as PDFs. Um, so using those accessibility checkers in all of the Microsoft products is huge. And then in PDFs, using the OCR recognition. So then that way it's not just a flat right. image, it's a scannable uh, image for a screen reader. That's really important too. Yeah. Great. And and um, for us who are creating PDFs is that that's, that's just something that how, how we're generating the PDF will need to be cognizant of. I imagine if you're publishing it from like Adobe Acrobat or something, it will kind yeah, of... It's just a, it's just a setting that, but... in Acrobat where you just check yeah. on having it be OCR recognized um and then it turns Great. it into a, like a readable it's the same thing of like if you needed somebody to copy and paste text from a pdf you'd run ocr recognition just to be able to to have that capability in there too great okay another question from anna um how do you keep things interesting and engaging but also simple and accessible and maybe this is a bigger conversation but i could see people having that concern and say like, okay well if i need this to be you know, accessible to everyone, is it going to be like too plain or too boring? Um, I can imagine people having that yeah. fear. There right. is this really great thing. Um, I'm, well, I'm saying it that way while I'm trying to get the, um, the document for it. So I'll just grab one of the press releases for it. Um, okay. You would think that for like, how do you keep something interesting, engaging, simple and accessible, right? I'm, what I'm gonna put in here is a, a deodorant. So degree deodorant, you've probably seen tons of their stuff on like a shelf. It's just another stick deodorant that's up on the shelf. And you think about it, you just grab a stick of deodorant. But they did something different recently. And they did a whole inclusive design for their, for their deodorant. So they got a whole bunch of people in the room and some of their information for all of this, if you search it out there, will show 
all of the people that they talked to. So they talked to people who um, had all of these different needs, but they still wanted to design something that was like, cool, that an everyday person would just see it on the shelf and be like, okay, that's degree deodorant. I still know it. I still know the brand. It's still something that's there. But it became like this beautiful, like sculptural piece for like deodorant. But that beautiful sculptural piece was also incredibly inclusive. So there's a hook on it for somebody who needs to be able to have it hooked on a shower so they can just pull and like yank down or use like two hands and yank it down. There's braille on the outside of the deodorant. So that way you can tell the difference between if it was deodorant or conditioner or shampoo. Um, there is a divot on the inside for people who have limited hand mobility and need to be able to have something to grasp it to a different way. So it's this thing of, it's still deodorant, right? And it's really pretty and you'd still look to grab it from the, the shelf, but like you did all of the due diligence to make this useful to so many different people. So when we're designing for like e-learning or uh, instructional design, it's really thinking about like the modalities that you're using. When I'm only using video or when I'm only using text or when I'm only using sound, that means I'm excluding a whole bunch of people from the room. So it's, I always want to yes and it. I always want to use video and text. I always want to use text and sound, or I always want to use video and sound, but provide another option there too. Because like nice. for neurodivergent individuals, like sometimes when we pack in a lot of things, like a lot of visuals and a lot of sound, it can overload and like really cause a lot of burnout for understanding and getting educational like concepts. So like cognitive loan is blowed for kind of everybody, but definitely for neuro uh, diverse people um, that becomes a huge burnout and a huge limitation for them. So it's really like, it really is kind of going down to that simple bit of the sauce of, okay, I know to, to teach this module these are my learning objectives. Okay, well, how can I get my learning objectives across in a way that is simple? Like, how do I explain it to a fifth grader, even if I'm like designing for college? Because everybody's degree of either digital literacy or literacy is different. And, you know, like you can always make multiple versions or have, um, like different level set challenges in your modules that you create. Um, but sometimes it just really is going back to that design thinking even type of question of what is the so that what? Like what is the end goal for what this student or learner needs to learn? Like so that they can do what? And usually if you keep that in the back of your mind of of what you want them to feel and what you want them to take away, and usually that's a great guiding principle going along with the standards. Excellent, yeah, great, great example. I remember you showed me this example not too long ago and it's very impressive, very illustrative. Yeah, it's like you don't, it's not like you're compromising. It's like, it's still this yeah, great product, but it's even more people can access it and enjoy it and experience it in the same way. Um, so yeah, maybe there are some design constraints. I know like drag and drops are like a non-accessible thing that people incorporate into e-learning. So it's like, um, there are many ways to be creative on how to assess the same or let people practice in the same way without using that type of interaction. So it might need to be a little bit creative if you're gonna do things that differently than how you've been doing them, but the, fun, the end experience doesn't need to be like a compromise basically. Like you said, it's like, we can do this and to make it more accessible for these other people without making it a worse experience for yeah. anyone. And like the biggest thing is like communities like yours, Devlin, like having a community in a space where you can ask questions to people uh, like your Slack group and all of the different like spots in there. Uh, if you're stuck and you're trying to think like, how can I do this differently? A community of people is like by far like the greatest way to get more brains noodling on a thing of like, hey, I have this drag and drop. 
and everybody says like this is the best way to do it but i need some other ideas like reaching out to a community of people is a really great way to to gain more for your accessibility skills too yeah and now and now people are going to be like go and check out that that webinar with holly miller because she shared some really helpful stuff there so. i do know too on um like uh, through all of the ways that I'm linked in from this event and everything. And on my LinkedIn, there's links out to my website as well. And I have my old slide deck from when I've presented useful inclusive design before as well too. Um, so there's a lot of like different things on that slide deck that, that we didn't touch about in here. And there's some things that we did touch about, um, but I'm always a resource to, to people and to your community as well to be able to say, hey, I have this accessibility question. And if I don't know the answer for it, then I at least know some other people to bring into the conversation to ask questions to, too. Um, so I do want to offer that out there as a resource to your community. Uh, there's easy ways to get a hold of me. I'm also part of the Slack group as well, too, for Devlin. And so um, that is a, an easy way if you have more accessibility questions. Uh, or you're just like, hey, uh, I just want to know a little bit more about this. Is there any other resources that you can provide? Um, I'd be happy to help out. Perfect. Well, that is a very nice offer. I just shared a call to action for everyone to connect with you on LinkedIn. So, so thank you for sharing that. If you're watching the, the replay on YouTube, we'll put that in the description as well. So thank you, Holly. Um, the Slack group. We just recently are migrating away to like a different platform for the community. Um, I see people asking about the Slack. We're not sending new people there. Our messages disappear. We won't get into it, but I'll, I'll share your link to join the, the community Great. space if you're interested. It's just devlinfect.com slash ID essentially to, to sign up. This was very, very helpful, Holly. I learned a lot here. I'm sure we all did too. And like I said, I think it will be helping people for a long time to come. Um, People will connect with you on LinkedIn. We'll check out that slide deck as well to learn more. And you shared so many helpful links with us. I feel like we could spend the next couple of days diving into all of this and <laughs> um, and start implementing it. So thank you everyone for coming. I think we're that's a wrap for the session. So we'll keep the conversation going on LinkedIn and in the community space. And let's all give the applause emoji maybe to um, Heather for for, to Holly for taking the time with us <laughs> and to Heather and everyone else thank who's been so asking much. questions and, and sharing info in the chat. Great. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for being with Holly. Cool. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you, everyone. I will talk to you all soon.